And in terms of what will attract more investors, obviously the gold price is number one. But number two, each of these quarters that are coming up that these companies keep printing very, very good results, extremely good free cash flow, higher dividends, more buybacks, that continue that, that continued performance will attract investors as well. At some point, uh, you look at the fundamentals of these companies, these gold equities, and it becomes kind of hard to ignore how good the free cash flow is. Hello and welcome viewers tuning in to One to One Mining Investment America's insights with some investors before we run into the uh, One to One meetings. Um, so today we're getting an update on the gold market and gold mining equities. Um, and I'm very pleased to catch up with Fahad Tariq, who is Vice President of Equity Research in Precious Metals at Credit Suisse Securities. Fahad, thanks for chatting with me again. Good to catch up with you. Thanks, Adam, for having me again. Happy to be on. Great. Um, yeah, so thinking back to last time we spoke, we were emphasizing um, how gold price movements were largely down to what rates were doing um, and the sort of low to negative interest rate environment that we've seen this year has been broadly constructive for gold. And, you know, um, this structural bull market, uh, while it's had some, some ups and downs this year, it seems to be uh, a very strong investment thesis. Um, perhaps let's just start about where we're at right now as we enter uh, middle, middle point of the summer. Yeah, so um, we picked an interesting day to have this discussion as we were speaking today with the US jobs report coming out better than expected. Uh, you're seeing gold prices take a bit of a hit down about two and a half percent today, uh, around 1760 an ounce. Um, but just zooming out for a second and seeing what's happened year to date, what we've really seen is gold kind of flat for, uh, for the first half of this year. And there's a couple of reasons for that, because you have conflicting forces really at play from a macro perspective. On the one hand, uh, you know, positive for gold, you have higher inflation, real world inflation data that you've seen over the past several weeks and months indicate that inflation is very high. Uh, and we see this in our daily lives as well. And so that's that's been positive for gold as uh, traditionally an inflation hedge. The other part of the equation, which is a bit more tricky, is trying to figure out nominal rates. Right. Obviously, nominal rates haven't changed for some time. They're near zero in the U.S. But what investors are focusing on is when the Fed will start raising rates. Um, and the jury is out on that because there are a group of investors um, that think that that won't happen until 2023. And there are, I would say, a growing number of investors that think it could happen before 2023. Why? Because the economic growth is actually quite good in the U.S. Now, uh, you take those two kind of factors together, the, the inflation and the nominal rates, put that together and you get real rates. If you look at what ha what's happening with real rates, we're actually at uh, record lows right now. So uh, as we're speaking today, uh, the tips yield in the U.S. is negative 1.1%. That is actually the lowest it's ever been. Um, it's lower than it was at the beginning of this year when gold was over $1,900 an ounce. It's lower than it was last summer when gold was over $2,000 an ounce. So what we've seen more recently is a bit of a decoupling between uh, gold prices and real rates. We would have expected gold prices to be higher um, today uh, than they are given what's happening with real rates. Um, and I think part of it again goes back to this idea that the market is very, very focused on what the US Fed is saying and whether or not they will begin tapering soon, whether interest rates can start rising before 2023. There's a, almost like a laser focus on that and what I think will happen is as investors kind of take a step back and really look at what's happening, even if the Fed were to decide to raise rates, let's say end of 2022, which is an optimistic scenario, um, even if that were to happen, we're talking about another 18 months of near zero nominal rates, very high inflation, record low real rates, all of that should be supportive uh, for gold prices. Oh, certainly, excellent to get that steer. So um, to summarize, though, on where you think the Fed's position might change, um, do you think they're going to continue on this dovish um, approach um, or, or, they, or are they going to look to make put rates higher um, than, than the 2023 expectation that some of your investors were, were, were pinning on it? Yeah, so that's the, the trillion dollar question, I Indeed. suppose. Um, so I, I think it's a tough call. So I think if you look at the consensus view of uh, just even the Fed's dot plot and what they're suggesting, it seems to be that 
um, and most recent commentary from their Fed vice chair and things like that. I think it would suggest that late 2022 is probably the earliest uh, you could start seeing the Fed start to raise rates. Um, again, that's 18 months from now. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of this depends on what happens over the next six months to a year. And I think uh, the market seems to be discounting or at least underappreciating the Delta variant in the U.S. and what that could mean for economic growth. Yes, we saw good jobs growth today and, uh, you know, good numbers today. But, um, you know, that's kind of looking historically at what happened in July. Things can change very quickly as we get into the second half of this year. If the Delta variant really holds, if it cases increase, um, you know, you could see the uh, economic growth slow down, unemployment kind of not really get to where the Fed wants. And if all of that happens, guess what? The Fed is in no rush to uh, raise rates. They have made it very clear that their policy priority is to have maximum uh, employment and broad and inclusive employment, which is uh, something a bit different than maybe the way they've worded previous policies. And it's really to make sure that all demographics are included in that, in that maximum employment. And that's a pretty tough uh, target. Um, they're not really focused on inflation. They, they continue to think it's transitory. And so I really think that you're talking about a, something that's gonna happen in late 2022. Mm. And uh, between now and then, uh, I think there's plenty of runway for gold prices to move higher. And that, that's our house view. Excellent. Um, okay, so looking at investor sentiment then, specifically for gold markets, um, both physical and the equities, um, I've been sort of reading around um, uh, Asian-based uh, gold ETFs posting net inflows this year. Um, and that's very much, you know, mainland China, um, surrounding as well as India. Um, and this, is, uh, this is interesting as sort of traditionally large buyers, certainly of physical gold. Um, what, what's your assessment of that and indication of that in contrast to how the US um, and the EU have had um, some outflows um, within, um, within precious metals or, or within gold specifically? Yeah, so you, you have periods where you have these geographic differences uh, between which regions have outflows and inflows. Um, I'm not reading too much into that other than to think about the fact that traditionally uh, during, uh, you know, during the year, you have very strong consumer demand from India and China. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular during the winter time when there's festivals and weddings and things like that. Yeah, um, we haven't really seen that this year. Uh, particularly in India. And, and there's an obvious reason for that. They've obviously been dealing with uh, COVID and, and quite extreme cases, including obviously the Delta variant. Um, and so that's really limited consumer buying of jewelry and, and, and that kind of gold demand this year. Uh, you've seen it pick up in July. Uh, it may pick up in the second half this year, but again, it's very contingent on what happens with COVID um, in, in, in India. So that demand um, is a bit subdued. Uh, on the investment side, you mentioned ETF demand and inflows. Um, look, I think, I think you know, when, what the market decides in terms of uh, where interest rates are going and where gold prices are heading, that's going to dictate ETF flows. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the biggest outflows we saw kind of across the world happened in Q1 of this year. Why? Because that's when um, you, know, you really started seeing nominal rates, treasury yields really start increasing. That was negative for gold. Uh, people really started thinking the Fed was going to uh, taper a lot sooner. And so uh, when that happens, people have a negative view on gold and you start seeing uh, quite significant outflows uh, across geographies. So I think second half of this year in terms of uh, investment demand and ETF inflows or outflows, is it'll really be dictated, on, dictated by what the market thinks will happen with uh, real rates, what the market think will, thinks will happen with gold prices. And I do think that if you have investors, for example, in India and China, uh, even on the retail side that are perhaps unable to go and buy physical gold because of restrictions and COVID, uh, some of that capital, uh, you know, it's, it's possible that some of that capital is switching to, uh, you know, call it paper gold or ETF uh, that are backed by gold. Okay, um, moving on to gold mining equities then and um, situation there, you know, there was a sell-off at the beginning of summer back in June, um, sort of uh, a large drop in, in, in valuations um, there. Um, are equities still trading at the significant discounts that you mentioned last time we spoke? Um, it seems that they're, they're still doing the, the work. The mining companies you follow are still posting excellent cash flow, et cetera. Um, these valuations seem to have come across, come off uh, based on a sort of a confidence or a confidence in the sector. Are you putting any sort of reasons to that or any explanations to, to what's going on there? 
Yeah, so certainly. So, uh, you know, you are seeing that persistent discount there. And, you know, I, I talked to a lot of investors and I think for me, the way I've characterized it is, you know, the vast majority of what moves these gold equities is uh, people's views on gold. And that's just the reality of it. You know, 80% of what moves the stocks is what, what gold prices do. The remaining 20% might be something specific to the company, uh, either good or bad. Um, so what I would say is more recently, we've, st- we've seen that persistent discount. So just to put some numbers around it, uh, you know, the average price of gold that's being priced into these stocks today is about 15 uh, 40 an ounce, right? So there's a clear discount. What the market is pricing in is obviously much lower gold prices in spot. Um, if you look at price to nav, net asset value, uh, again, you see a pretty persistent discount. Uh, in our coverage, on average, trading at about 1.3 times, the historical average is close to 1.8 times, right? So there's a quite substantial discount. And then when you go into specific kind of groups of these companies, that discount can be quite wide as well. Some of the lower cap uh, gold companies are trading at a really uh, steep discount to their historical average. Uh, again, a lot of that is driven by uh, market sentiment on gold. Um, you know, what I would say is there's actually no consensus view out there for gold right now. It's very dissimilar to last year where the view was, okay, gold's going to go up. We just don't know how high it's going to go. This mm-hmm. year, uh, half the investors I talk to think gold prices are going to go up. The other half think it's going to be flat to down. So when you don't have that strong view on gold, um, that persistent discount kind of stays. And in fact, what ends up happening is um, gold companies that are larger, more diversified with bigger market caps, they tend to trade at better valuations. And then the smaller you know, or mid cap gold companies, they trade to, tend to trade at a steeper discount. Why? Because investors, if they're not sure about the gold price, they're going to pick the safest, most liquid, most diverse in terms of production and geography. They're going to pick those companies. And so I'm seeing a pretty uh, steep discount across the board, but I'm also seeing a pretty d- big divide between the bigger gold companies and the more mid cap, smaller gold companies. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Uh, that's interesting. Um, so um, do you see this as sort of a, a shorter term uh, discount, uh, the blip? I, uh, I can appreciate the sort of um, the difference between the sort of the larger best of the best from, from, from the juniors, for instance, um, but do you think there are some, some reasons in the capital is perhaps looking, uh, we spoke before about the Bitcoin effect, is capital also looking at green stocks or green mining, green metals, uh, you know, copper and lithium um, are, are, are extremely attractive um, amid this sort of broader commodities boom. There's clearly a narrative if you think about Biden's infrastructure plan as to where um, a company that could position itself as a green metal or a technology-based metal um, could go. Do you think some of the the capital that would have traditionally gone to safer gold miners is moving into those other areas now? Yeah, so I think all of that is true. So I think if you, as an investor, if you're looking at maybe not what's going to happen in the next three to six months, but if you have a longer term view, I think a lot of investors are thinking about this as well. Gold is cyclical. It's always been cyclical. And I'm not, I'm not going to deny that it's cyclical. Um, and so at some point it's going to come down. And so investors who are thinking a bit longer term are thinking, well, you know, uh, you may have another year, 18 months of really good gold prices, and then it kind of tapers off. Um, and, you know, we can, we can debate how low it will go. I think because of debt levels around the world, you may see pretty, his- versus historical, you may see pretty high gold prices uh, for some time. Uh, but in any case, investors who are looking at different commodities, different metals, they're thinking, well, gold eventually will come down in prices just because it's cyclical and eventually macroeconomic conditions will change. You know, we're not going to be in a low interest world forever. Um, But when you look at some of the other metals like copper and lithium, there's real structural demand there. You Mm -hmm. talked about the EV transition, you talked about renewable power. These things are real demand. And so as, as we, you know, kind of adopt these technologies more and more, there's real demand that's being built up for these metals. And the same cannot really be said about gold. And I think that's where, um, you know, as you're talking about kind of a longer term time frame, I think that dynamic really comes into play. And that also explains why um, investors are far more interested these days and have been for some time in copper and lithium, for example, than they are in uh, gold. Uh, mm-hmm. Why? Because, they're, again, they're, they're having a hard time trying to figure out which way gold's headed in the next you know, six months to a year. But they're also thinking, well, long term. Uh, I'm comparing a cyclical metal, which is gold, to something that has kind of fundamental strong support, maybe even structural deficits for uh, the next decade. If you're talking about things like copper, there's many, many uh, analysts out there who will tell you that uh, 
Uh, there hasn't been nearly enough investment in new copper mines and production. So you're going to see a deficit for quite some time. And so I think that's how investors are thinking about it. And that also explains what you're seeing in terms of trading volumes. Um, you know, we, I, I talk obviously, you know, very, very often to our, our traders and, you know, we hear about more volumes on some, for some of the other metals versus, um, uh, you know, the gold miners and even companies themselves. I've talked to a number of management teams that are saying we're not seeing that, man, you know, that much interest these days in, in gold equity. So, I do think there's a bit of a structural divide, but what I would say is investors who are perhaps not thinking three, five years out, but are thinking over the next six months to a year or 18 months, um, that's an opportunity where uh, I think the gold sector is being neglected and unduly neglected. There's, there's obviously some uh, really good fundamentals there. And in terms of what will attract more investors, obviously the gold price is number one, but number two, each of these quarters that are coming up that these companies keep printing very, very good results, extremely good free cash flow, higher dividends, more buybacks, that, continue, that, that continued performance will attract investors as well. At some point, uh, you look at the fundamentals of these companies, these gold equities, and it becomes kind of hard to ignore how good the free cash flow is, mm -hmm. uh, how good the capital return is. Uh, you're talking about gold companies now that, you know, many of them are paying north of 3% dividend yield. That was unheard of. And in fact, compared to the S&P average, 500 average, it's, it's quite a bit higher. So again, you have these fundamental factors that will also get people interested in gold uh, over the next year or so. Yeah, definitely. Um, it does sound like, you know, this is the buying opportunity at the moment um, in, in, in this little period. Um, but that leads me to think about, you know, M&A. And does that mean that with slightly suppressed valuations, um, does it open the door to great deals to be done? Uh, yeah, so I think, um, so So that's a fair point. So last year I would have said, you know, because of the high gold price, you're not gonna see yeah. much M&A because anyone willing to sell is obviously asking for a lot, uh, a lot higher price. Now, gold prices have come down a little bit. I think you're going to see more consolidation. Uh, I think, again, the theme hasn't changed. It's going to be more in the mid-cap space. Companies looking to get larger, uh, have stronger liquidity and things like that. Um, I don't really see any of the majors engaging in any substantial M&A. What we've seen more recently is uh, mine acquisitions or smaller company acquisitions and geographies that they like. Uh, versus going out and buying another giant company. So I don't think you're going to see any mega mergers among the seniors and the majors. I think you're going to see consolidation uh, in the mid cap space. And, mm -hmm. and that trend will continue as gold prices weaken, valuations become more attractive. The need to consolidate probably becomes a bit more obvious. Um, the other thing I'll say is, you know, last year, a lot of these companies got a pass on reserve growth, right? Many companies, they weren't able to drill because of COVID and pandemic restrictions. Uh, exploration uh, wasn't Quite to the level they wanted and so many of them had either flat reserves or even declining reserves uh, in their year-end statements and there was a pass from investors on that nobody was really held to account for that this year i think there's going to be a really big focus on reserve growth because you can't point to the same restrictions that you had last year so the yes. expectation is higher and so i think as investors focus more on reserve growth guess what that's also going to spark the discussion on m a because you can either explore and if that's not working, you're going to really have to go out and, and buy something for inorganic growth. So I do think that the lower gold price, um, the more discussion around reserve growth, that will drive uh, more M&A. Yep. Excellent. Um, do you look at the streaming and royalties within the precious metals, those companies as well? You know, they um, traditionally perform very well in, in, in bear markets as well because of the model um, and if they're specifically focused on gold, which a lot of them are, um, do they present a great buying opportunity for the investors that you're talking to? Yeah, so um, so uh, so let me start with what our house view is. So our house view is that gold prices are going to go up from where we are today. In that environment, we prefer producers versus royalty streaming companies. However, uh, I, I, told, I mentioned earlier that um, investors don't have such a strong view on gold. They're not sure if it's going to go up or down. And so in that environment, uh, investors really like the royalty streaming companies because they provide that, you know, stable cost base, uh, upside potential, but margins stay relatively uh, flat. They're pretty, you know, pretty stable margins. And so guess what? Uh, year to date, the best performing stocks in my coverage universe are Franco Nevada, number one, mm -hmm. followed by Wheaton Precious Metals, number two, both royalty streaming companies. And that's not a coincidence. It's because of this macro view on gold, which is uncertain. Uh, these companies tend to do better. These stocks tend to do better in that environment. They don't tend to do better in an environment where there's a very strong bull thesis on gold. Uh, 
um, for example, in the latter half of last year. Yeah. So, so do I think these companies will continue to do well? Yes. If this in the, in this environment where investors are unsure about the gold price, they could continue to trade at these levels. What I would caution is that the valuation multiples are quite high for a company like Franco Nevada. It's, it's quite expensive, uh, and in fact, you've seen some analysts downgrade the stock as a result of some of the just a higher valuation, not anything fundamental to the company, but just that it's expensive. Um, so that's one kind of cautionary uh, note. The one thing I think that's really going for these royalty streaming companies in the second half of this year, and we didn't really talk about this, is just the inflationary pressure. So if you're a producing company, the number one theme that has come up over the past month is inflation. You're seeing higher labor costs, higher diesel costs, higher cyanide costs, higher steel costs, everything across the board. The royalty streaming companies are ins insulated from that. Uh, they don't have that operational cost exposure they get a cut of the revenue um, and they have stable costs based on what they acquired the stream or royalty at. So they're, they're really protected from these inflationary pressures. And I think you're going to see Franco Nevada, Wheat and Precious Metals, Triple Flag, all these royalty streaming companies are going to really talk up the fact that they're protected from cost inflation. Uh, and you're going to see that over the second half this year. And that, that could be a positive uh, factor for the stocks as well. Yeah. Excellent. Um, the last point I wanted to make was um, uh, around the inflation, and we spoke about it a bit at the beginning on the macro side. But it, um, you know, uh, the IMF reports on global inflation is pretty high. Um, this has to support, in the long term view, a great a great case for, for gold. Um, I'm sure you're you're bullish on on the long term view, but just recap the sort of thesis that you keep reminding investors of. Yeah, so we we always remind investors that look for gold. I think you can look at a lot of different factors and there's a lot of noise. And to us, when we try to find that signal in the noise, it's really the real rates, right? So nominal inflation, uh, nominal uh, interest rates, excuse me, minus inflation. Yeah. And so on your point on inflation, look, I think you can see in your real world examples around you how much things have, how much more expensive things have gotten. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on how you measure inflation, you can get wildly different numbers, even using conservative uh, estimates, you know, you're running well ahead of what the, the U.S. Fed, for example, thinks at two or two and a half percent is was well ahead of that. Um, and so I think inflation is going is not transitory. I think you're going to see it for some time. Do I think some parts of inflation are transitory? Of course, there's some supply chain issues that we're seeing today as a result of the pandemic and as a result of restrictions. Those will go away over time as things reopen. However, if you have wage inflate wage based inflation, which is that you know minimum wages are increasing in many parts of the world, in particular in the U.S. Um, as wages increase, uh, you know theoretically the price of goods and services also increases, and that's permanent. You know that's not going away. So I think inflation is here to stay for some time. Um, I think the extremely high inflation we're seeing today, you know, obviously that's not sustainable for a long period of time. Um, so that's that's all of that is bullish for gold. The other thing I would mention is you know. We talked, we talked at the outset about how the market is really worried about the Fed raising interest rates. The one thing that investors don't really talk as much about is the fact that absolute levels of debt in the U.S. and all basically all parts of the world are extremely high. There are record levels. Yeah. So it actually limits how high interest rates can go. It's not that we can go back to historical interest rates um, anytime soon. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about those interest rates being applied to an extremely high base of debt that hasn't existed before. Um, so I think one thing that the market doesn't talk about all too much, and I'm not an economist, so I, you know, I don't necessarily have a strong opinion on this, is how high can interest rates go? And if they can't go that high because absolute levels of debt are so high and inflation is high because it's really driven by, dri being driven by this wage, uh, higher wages, then you're in an environment where there's only, it's only so high that real interest rates can go. And if they stay persistently negative or stay below zero, that all of that is positive for gold. So I think that that's kind of the takeaway here is no matter how you slice the macroeconomic data, um, I think longer term, or at least in the medium term, you, you have a situation where gold prices are going to be high for some time. Now, I'm not saying they're going to be at you know, $2,000 an ounce forever uh, or close to that, but you can make a very solid argument that they're going to be at pretty high levels relative to historical for, for quite some time. And that's very positive for these gold miners. I think people get caught up in what the gold price is doing without realizing that whether gold prices are at 1600 or 1900 uh, at any of those prices in between, these gold miners are generating significant free cash flow. Um, and you can see that every quarter that they're reporting results. 
Yeah, that's a very good point. They can make money at far lower gold prices than where we're at right now. This isn't necessarily a bad gold price. It's just come down off of the pandemic highs, if you like. Right. Yeah. Okay, Fahad, excellent. Thank you very much for the update. It's been really great getting um, some insights of where we're at right now in the gold space. And uh, very good to talk with you again. Thanks again for having me.